up on Tech News today, how Twitter won the election, Gabon not pleased with Kim.com, and Guitar Heroes maker wants to make it easier for you to game in your living room with your mobile. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, November 7th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Landtronics, maker of the X-Print server. Print from your iPad, iPhone, or any iOS device to virtually any printer. For more information, visit xprintserver.com slash twit and enter the coupon code TWIT to receive free shipping on your order. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we try to keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, put them in context for you, starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the News Fuse. <laughs> the big winner of yesterday's U.S. presidential election, math. Yay, Another math. big winner, Twitter. Twitter creative lead Doug Bowman posted... R.I.P. Fail Whale, we assume because of the lack of any significant outage or server problems for Twitter, under the surge of election night posts. Retweets got the biggest workout when President Obama's Four More Years post was retweeted more than 600,000 times, a new record for Twitter. The Verge reports that the somewhat mythical Office for iOS and Office for Android is, in fact, right around the corner, with the iOS version arriving as early as February 2013 and the Android version expected in May. The apps will be free with a Microsoft account required to access Office documents. Editing capability will come only with an Office 365 subscription. AT&T is making it rain. First up, AT&T announced Project Velocity IP otherwise known as Project VIP, in which the company will spend $14 billion to upgrade its wireline and wireless networks over the next three years. $8 billion is going to wireless improvements, like an expanded LTE network, and $6 billion for wireline improvements, like fiber optic lines. AT&T is also throwing $700,000 at the FCC. In coins? I don't know if it's in coins. As a settlement for switching some of its unlimited users to monthly plans without consent or knowledge. Refunds will also be issued to those whose plans were switched. Kim.com's new service, Me.ga, or Mega, has already hit a snag. Uh, the company's domain name belongs to Gabon, and the government of Gabon says it plans to suspend the domain name. Gabon's communications minister said the country's domain name quote, cannot serve as a platform or screen for committing acts aimed at violating copyrights, nor be used by unscrupulous people. Oops. A U.S. district court in Texas has ordered Apple to pay $368.2 million to VPN company Vimit X for violating its patents by putting FaceTime into Macs and iOS devices. Vimit X sued Apple earlier this year over four patents it owns relating to web video. The technology was originally developed within a division of the CIA for setting up secure communications, but was later spun out into this public company. The company has actually won a case against Microsoft in 2010 uh, to the tune of $200 million and has cases pending against Cisco, Avaya, and Siemens. Microsoft is killing off its Windows Live Messenger brand and client for most of the world in quarter one of 2013. <gasps> Why? Because in instead, you'll see the Skype name as the brand, and you'll have to use the Skype client. Uh, in China, mm. the Messenger name will remain. On the back end, Microsoft has rebuilt Skype's instant messaging to use a mix of Azure and Messenger's infrastructure so the Skype client can connect to both networks so things will still be okay. So is Skype a dirty pun in Mandarin or something? Is that why? I don't know. Offhand. Hmm. Right in. Let us know. Terry Gao, chairman of Han Hai, the parent of Foxconn, told reporters at an economic forum that the company is shipping far fewer new iPhones than Apple has requested due to design-related production difficulties. Investors are concerned that the scarcity of iPhones may weigh on Apple's earnings this quarter. Just a few weeks ago, Japan's SoftBank announced it had acquired a 70% stake in Sprint. Now, Sprint has announced it will acquire 30 megahertz of PC 
S spectrum in the 1900 megahertz band, and customers in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Missouri, and Ohio from U.S. Cellular, the seventh largest wireless carrier in the U.S., for $480 million in cash and the assumption of certain liabilities. Sprint says the additional spect spectrum will supplement its coverage in the areas as it continues to roll out 4G LTE across the U.S. The transaction involves approximately 585,000 U.S. Cellular customers. Missouri. Really? What are you from? Come Jeff? on, isn't that what you say there? You're from Jeff City or something? I, I'm, I'm sorry. I was trying to be all, hey, uh, me and Tom are simpatico. So I, I <laughs> Netflix still leads the pack of online video providers. If you look at bandwidth usage, research firm Sandvine released a report showing Netflix has 33% of primetime downstream traffic in September, a slight increase for the same period a year ago. YouTube comes second with 14.8% of the bandwidth. Amazon Prime still small at 1.75%, but it's growing, passing Hulu's relatively stagnant 1.38%. Oh, this is going to go well. Google redesigned its search <laughs> results page. Say goodbye to that left sidebar and hello to uh, uh, white space where that navigation was. The tools are now moved above the search results and below the Google search bar. The redesign is live in the U.S. and will roll out in other regions soon. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by the fine sponsorship of Landtronics. Uh, whether you're at home or at the office printing from your iPhone or iPad, can be a challenge. There's there's AirPrint and there's AirPrint uh, enabled printers and those are great. But what if your printer isn't AirPrint compatible? You're out of luck unless you use the box from Landtronics. Uh, we use the XPrint server. I've used it at home. Got one hooked up and it's really easy. Uh, it enables wireless printing from your iPad, your iPhone, your iPod Touch, any of your iOS device, and it eliminates the need to print through apps. Uh, you don't have to install any software. You don't have to email yourself documents. You don't have to mess with USB sticks or anything. Uh, it was much easier than I expected it to be when they sent me the box. I plugged in the Lantronics uh, box to my uh, internet router at home, uh, got it on the network, went to my iOS device, and pretty much just saw a the print menu right there in the iOS app and was able to print right there. That it, it, it's it. Supports more than 4,000 top brand network printers and really easy to use. They've done a great job with automatic discovery and printer set setup. You pretty much just open it, plug it in, and print. I mean, I, I did it myself, so I can I can vouch for you. If you want to learn more, though, please go to xprintserver.com slash twit to find more information and to buy one yourself. And we've got a special offer, too. You knew we would. Use the coupon code TWIT to receive free shipping on your order. Remember, visit xprintserver.com slash twit. And at checkout, enter the coupon code TWIT. We thank Lantronics a lot for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to uh, put some of these stories in context for you, Rich DeMuro, tech reporter at KTLA down in Los Angeles. Uh, how's it going, Rich? Welcome back to the show. Hey, Tom. Glad to be hailing from your uh, soon-to-be new home. That's Thanks right. for having me here. Yeah, I am invading your, uh, your city come January, so watch out. Hopefully this town is big enough for two tech people. <laughs> I don't think so. It's such a, such a tiny little hamlet, Los Small Angeles. place. I know. It's going to be a battle. Uh, speaking of battles, of course, yesterday uh, the big election uh, President Obama projected uh, to win. Looks like that that is going to carry through in the Electoral College. We covered it, Sarah Lane and I, uh, Justin Robert Young. Uh, we did a little live hangout uh, during the uh, during the returns last night. And what was interesting is as soon as we heard that NBC News and Fox News were projecting the re-election, we were sort of waiting to see, like, okay, is CNN going to do this? You know, let's get a critical mass before we really call it. But the Barack Obama Twitter account posted this happened because of you at 8 14 p.m just a couple of minutes it, it, it kind of surprised me sarah that they yeah, went right to yeah, twitter you know, it, in fact i think i think the first thing we said in our coverage was justin saying chat room says uh that they called ohio for obama and we go well that's chat room now come on now someone might be screwing with you and then it was like well fox news says this it's like man that's just one source Hold on now, everybody, just hold your horses. And before we could really think about anything, we've got Barack Obama's official account, um, you know, by, by no means any, anybody but his uh, campaign, tweeting that, and it was kind of just over from there and Twitter exploded. 
And and uh, not all the networks had called it. Governor Romney certainly had not yet conceded. Uh, and at 8.16 p.m., just a couple of minutes later, uh, the famous Four More Years post with a link to a picture of Michelle Obama uh, hugging her husband uh, was posted. That has now become the most retweeted post ever. Last I checked, it was over 638,000, but I'm sure I'm sure it's gone up. I, I think it's 666,000 or, or more now. Uh, that is the most retweeted post on Twitter, beating Justin Bieber's 225,000. It's interesting are, that... Are uh, we going to see a picture of what he had tweeted? I don't know. Or, I don't know. Uh, what that, I was just hoping Bieber? to make this about Bieber. I just Bieber like the idea bit. that this is part of our world now. You know that the campaign had to figure out what they were going to tweet and when they were going to... Well, maybe not when they were going to tweet it, but they knew... You know, they had to plan for what this tweet was going to say and what this picture was going to look like well before they uh, won the election. So I think that's pretty fascinating to see that this is part of our world now. Obviously, these are the most retweeted things. Um, and those are things that are just it says little. It says a lot in a little. You got uh, 3.1 million likes on that same photo on Facebook. Sent an email out to supporters with the subject line, how this happened at 8.41 p.m. Again, before Mitt Romney had conceded, before Barack Obama had taken to the stage in Chicago with an acceptance speech. So essentially, the president accepted the election results on Twitter. Uh, it, it, it kind of... It, it, it's, it, are we making too much of that if we say this is a huge change in the protocol of accepting election IAS? Or, or is Twitter still seen as this kind of more informal thing and, and not really the true acceptance? Well, I mean, I think what we've seen is the shift in the, the traditional news organizations to the point where they are so afraid of getting it wrong that there's a huge delay before we find out what, what happened. And like I'm sure the president found out well ahead of time before the news, oh, yeah, you, you're reelected. He put it out on Twitter and his campaign put it out on Twitter. I think uh, Twitter does have this bit of, okay, well, if you make a mistake on it, maybe it's not necessarily so bad. You can delete a tweet, <laughs> even though you can, you can, it can be retweeted tons of times. Uh, and if the president made a mistake and that, let's say that happened and he didn't get elected, they'd be like, oh, that happens. It must have been a mistake. And that would be a whole other story. But the it's news. It's also, go sorry, go, go ahead, Ayaz. I was going to say, but the news organizations just didn't want to even say anything definitively until it was all over. This is all, it's also worded really carefully, as Rich was saying. I mean, this happened because of you, thank you, being the tweet that we all interpret to mean, yeah, I accept. Uh, but it doesn't really say that. You know, it's not the same thing as a press conference. Well, if he had lost, would it have turned into a blaming tweet? <laughs> this happened <laughs> because of so. you. <laughs> and that, Thanks I think a this lot. just goes to show the, the, the power of Twitter in general. I mean, we're seeing that Twitter is sort of one-upping news organizations every day. I mean, news organizations themselves are relying on Twitter to look to see what the latest news is and to look for leads. So um, this is the way we break news nowadays. Twitter is where news breaks. It used to be maybe a blog. It used to be, you know, there, we've seen that progression. It used to be you went on a, a nationwide television show to break news. Now you do it on Twitter and then the news follows. So I find that pretty fascinating. Yeah, and I, I guess it doesn't undermine the drama of the speeches and everything because you, people still want to hear uh, what both candidates have to say uh, in this sort of situation. But it, it is, to me, it's a, it's a big big change uh, for the internet to be the first place for everything. I guess I'm on, on the silly Not side. Not just for news, just, you know. I'm very, very curious what the other picture would have been if he had lost, or is that picture consolatory, like in case he lost? It's like, it's okay, you I could still got You each can other. interpret that picture either yeah. way. I I'm guess. just kind of curious. Yeah. That picture is just reversed, yeah. so and it looks totally different. It means something <laughs> totally different. It's just All right, the mirror uh, image of that picture. And you know, it, just, I, it feels so different. I blew this because I forgot to give uh, Jason space to play the tech collection uh, bumper. But if you if you still have it up, let's yeah, let's, let's give play it. it. Let's you give know, it one, one more, more one more. Just, area. just take it in. Yeah, <laughs> that's the last time you'll see that. Uh, at least with that Maybe we'll get it tweaked, there. yeah. yeah. All right, uh, let's talk about uh, Kim.com and how Gabon not really having it. They're like, no, yeah. you can't use it, our domain name. It's a mess. So last week we talked about Kim.com's new plan. He's like, Mega Upload is coming back. It's going to be called Mega. It's going to use the Gabon domain, which is .ga. So that's me.ga. And you're going to love it. You'll see it in January. And everybody went, oh, my God, look, he's getting around U.S. authorities because they can't see his domain. Um, Blase Luembe, um, which, as Tom mentioned, is uh, Gabon's communications minister, says, no, 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 we're not going to do this. We're going to suspend this. We're not going to have any part of unscrupulous people um, using our country for their own gain. This is according to New Zealand publication stuff.co.nz. 
Uh, the attorney for Mega Uploads Worldwide Defense uh, confirmed to CNET that, yeah, we're not actually going to be able to use that mega domain after all. Uh, he quoted, Mega Upload and Kim are innocent and proved uh, presumed innocent. It sounds like a lack of net neutrality in Gabon. We're just going to use a different domain. So basically, yeah, it would have been a kind of nice name, but it's not the end of the world if they don't want to play nice with us. They've probably got net neutrality issues there anyway. Uh, .com had a reaction on Twitter, which was kind of interesting. He tweeted, the reach of the USN Vivendi, Gabon minister announced mega domain will be suspended, calls cloud storage site cybercrime. Now, it's, that's a little bit hard to decipher if you don't understand what he's referencing, but there was a Numerama article last week that revealed the top level domain of Gabon is administered by Gabon Telecom, which is whole, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Vendi Entertainment Group, mm -hmm. which as you can imagine, not great friends with Mega Upload. So he's kind of going, okay, this is a bit conspiracy. It's not really the country at all, it's Vivendi. Um, meanwhile, uh, at least for some time this morning, the last time I checked, I couldn't even get the domain to, to load at all, the, the URL to load at all. Mega had been take over, taken over by what is presumed to be a hacker group. Uh, it was directing to a group calling themselves Omega. They had put together a <laughs> Twitter account uh, that was only a few hours old as of this morning and called .com a lot of names. They said he was a megalomaniac and he's a polluter. It. I know. You see what they did there? And, you know, just pretty much he's a bad guy and we would be open to entertaining offers from his enemies in the millions of dollars or bitcoins <laughs> for this domain that we now have control over. Now, who knows what's going on here, depending on uh, what... Uh, comment threads you read on the sites people say ah you know these are this isn't this is just fake this is these aren't real hackers they a real hacker would never would never actually be working with the man in this fashion so kind of hard to know what's going on but suffice to say that mega as in me.ga is probably not going to happen and I doesn't think, mean that the service won't happen in some other form, but this is not it. This is not the solution. And and I think this is unsurprising. Uh, you know, it would if it were not Kim.com involved, uh, I would be willing to have a, a big conversation about whether it is legal uh, or right for an, a top-level domain administrator to unilaterally block a site uh, before it is proven to have done anything wrong uh, that, you know, the uh, what what Kim.com says about having a file sharing site is not illegal. Having a cloud storage site is not illegal. Uh, but at the same time, this is the wrong guy to blaze that trail. Uh, he, yeah, ha he, he, has, uh, he has a reputation, if not a record. Mm -hmm. So I understand why, even if Vivendi weren't involved, the, the country of Gabon might not want to be involved with this person. On the other hand, I think Kim.com is probably right. I think Vivendi probably, you know, picked up the phone, called the uh, the the government in Gabon and said, hey, we see this domain name, squash it. And that's the end of it. I don't know that that's the way it should work, but I'm not sure this is the proper test case for that. Yeah, this guy's not the poster child for, you know, saying, hey, we're just trying to set up a nice website where people can be free to share what they want. And, you know, most of the time it's artists putting up their songs that, uh, you know, they've come up with. No, this is something totally different. This is also, I mean, this could be like a giant troll operation on the side of Kim.com and Make Upload. I mean, they've only announced a new service. We've we've heard some details about how the service would work with encryption and et cetera, but it's not like there's anything up and running at this point. You know, we were talking about the economics of, um, of malware the other day and how the Russian government could do more to stop this kind of thing from going on what's going on inside their own country. It seems like this is a very small country, Gabon. It's got 1.6 million people, 98,000 people on the internet. So it seems like it would be almost, I wouldn't say irresponsible, close to irresponsible to be like, yeah, by the way, our biggest domain name and the biggest thing that's going to happen here is with this kind of shady operation. And like you were saying, Tom, you know, dot com is not doing himself any favors with the amount of like flouting of the law and this constant like, hey, FBI, we know you're pinging us that, you know, and all kinds of uh, he's just kind of charging them up. So wherever he moves this domain to, they either have to have some kind of like 
well, maybe he's actually going to set up those servers in the sky that the Pirate Bay always talked about. Because I don't know what uh, what country is going to be like just welcoming him with open arms. This isn't like WikiLeaks where there's a he could do, he could go to a dot com. There's plenty of registrars out there that will they'll shield him. I mean, he's not going to have a problem getting a domain name. Yeah, I think he just liked the idea of Mega because mm -hmm. it was M E dot G A. Uh, I don't think he did much checking with the government of Gabon <laughs> before he registered it. All right, uh, let's talk about network traffic. We had this in the news views. Uh, the Sandvine Company uh, d had their Global Internet Phenomena Report come out today. The these are the folks that first reported that Netflix used so much of your bandwidth every evening. Uh, Netflix captured 33% of primetime downstream internet traffic in September. That's not much of a rise, to be honest, but it's stability for Netflix, and it's very far ahead of the competitors. YouTube, which is a free service, right, versus the paid version of Netflix, only gets half that, 14.8%. BitTorrent, uh, and, I, and I'm assuming this means all BitTorrent protocols, not just BitTorrent.com, the legitimate BitTorrent service, gets 5.8%. It's actually not that much bandwidth being used by BitTorrent. Apple iTunes, 3.92%. And then the direct Netflix competitors, Amazon, 1.7%, Hulu, 1.38%, HBO Go, just, just above a half of a percentage uh, in the downloads. So the, Netflix is, is strong and it is used. Now, granted, you could tweak these stats by you know, increasing the file size you deliver and suddenly your percentage gets bigger. But uh, presumably that's not in the best interest of these sites who want to stream uh, good quality video to their customers in, in an efficient way. So these work as a proxy, uh, relatively speaking, for market share. When you switch to the mobile numbers, YouTube actually uses the biggest bandwidth, 30.97% on mobile uh, of any site. The next video site is seventh. That's Google Play, followed by Netflix and iTunes on mobile. So YouTube, a big hit around the world as far as mobile use goes. Here, here's what I think is happening with Netflix. I think that um, it, it kind of depends on how people see these services. So Netflix, I feel like, has a very loyal following. I feel like people that subscribe to Netflix really try to use it to its fullest potential. So they're looking for documentaries on there. They're looking for things to watch on there. Whereas on YouTube, you know, you might find, you might follow YouTube links. I mean, obviously, it's a very popular site. But um, I think that it's the way people use these. I have a subscription to Hulu Plus. I have a subscription to Amazon Prime. I have a subscription to Netflix. And I'll tell you, I use them in that order. So I use Netflix, then I use Hulu, then I use uh, Amazon Prime. Prime, I never think to look for stuff on there. It's just like one of those things where if I'm looking for something to watch, uh, like a documentary, and it's not on anything else, I'll go to, to the Prime. Um, and the same thing with Hulu. Hulu is like, to me, it seems like it's more of a... Um, a place where you just go to kind of watch stuff that you already know about. So, oh yeah, I want to see that show. I'm going to watch all those episodes and just kind of do that. Whereas I feel like Netflix, people just look to discover more content on there. So it's a kind of a different way that people see the site that makes it so sticky and so popular. That's my Sarah, my does it surprise you that Amazon is in front of Hulu in this? Considering yeah. what Rich was just saying, I think most people think of Amazon less than they think of Hulu. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't want to say that Amazon isn't a great service, but... And, and quite honestly, I, I use Hulu more often than I use Netflix. And the reason is because I just get more updated content. There's less of it, but more updated content more regularly on uh, current shows. Uh, I agree. So I personally use uh, Hulu. Hulu is actually, you know, this is my, uh, it's Wednesday. I get home from work. I've got an hour to kill. I watch, you know, Tuesday night's daily show, that sort of thing. It's like, it's, it's. It's a little bit behind, but not really. So Hulu's kind of my, it's my go-to, you know, as a cord cutter goes. But I I don't know. I mean, maybe riches and, and my habits just don't reflect what most people think of when they think of content that's on demand. Netflix is great. Don't get me wrong. Once I find a series on Netflix that I'm into, you know, I watch it until I don't have any, any more um, episodes to watch. But usually there are a couple seasons behind anyway, and then I get caught up, and then I sort of forget about it, and I move on. See, I kind of disagree saying Netflix is great. I think it was great at a time. I feel like it's gone downhill. I feel like most of the studios here in L.A. are actually... Um, they're hesitant to do business with, with Netflix at this point because in the beginning of Netflix, that was the only game in town. They said, oh, we got to get our stuff on here. We got to get the full catalog. We got to get the back catalog. But nowadays, they're much savvier and they're saying, no, 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 you know what? You're not going to get the stuff. You're not going to get the good stuff. And Hulu has been cutting deals left and right. Um, you know you're going to get current shows. I mean, the fact is, you know, the, you, you're, there's stuff that people are watching is on there. And Hulu continues to kind of kill it. 
um, with not only the catalog of current stuff. I mean, yeah, there's there's not really movies on there. I mean, there are, but not worth watching that I've seen. Um, but they also have, you know, the popular clips. So, I mean, you don't even have to watch the entire uh, Fallon show. It's like the best clips just rise to the top and they have this sort of algorithm and, you know, the popular stuff that YouTube has. And it really is a very compelling service. And I think that if they, um, you know, they added CBS, but the library shows recently. But I really think what Hulu is doing is is sort of, it's way better for the average subscriber right now than Netflix. I feel like Netflix has gotten very stale in their catalog and their catalog has not really gotten better. It's kind of gotten worse to me over time. Ayaz, do you think that that stale catalog is why Netflix is sort of flat in this number? It's just coasting and we see Amazon Prime. Granted, it's way far behind, but it's doubled its bandwidth share since the last report. And Reed Hastings, even in the last earnings call from Netflix, warned, hey, we've got competitors out there that we have to keep an eye on. You know, considering how Netflix had a bit of turnover when it comes to its catalog, even though it seems a bit stale, they've been losing some really top tier things. The fact that they keep growing or even at a slow rate, even when they lost stars and things like that, the top tier movies, I think it's a little bit surprising that they stayed at that kind of level. I know they've added all kinds of autoplay things, so it's really easy to just to keep watching things on Netflix and you could eat up that bandwidth. And again, Netflix is on every device, right? So yeah. it's That's very easy. That's their ace in the hole right there. Very easy to get onto there. But Amazon, and I'm looking at the iTunes numbers as well, you know, when you think about new movies and you want to see rentals or something that's available now instead of going, well, I can watch this really old, you know, terrible movie on Netflix or I can watch the latest movie that just came out. I mean, I think people are more likely to go to Amazon and go, oh, yeah, by the way, I can watch a new movie instead of go, I'm watching this this mock, what's it called, the Mockbusters? I watch a whole bunch of them on Netflix. Yeah. I'd rather watch the real movie of Sherlock Holmes on Amazon. I think that's, uh, I, as you hit upon it, I think the biggest value of Netflix right now is the fact that they already have the technology and the reach that almost no other streaming internet service has. So the fact that we've seen them go into things like, uh, uh, what's that show that they did, the, the Lily Guard, what was it, Lily, uh, Lily, Lily Hammer. Hammer. So, I mean, the fact they're doing that, I see Netflix doing a talk show just the way uh, Hulu has. I mean, Hulu has really expanded the original programming, and uh, they're not even available on half the devices that Netflix is. And I think that also goes to the fact that a lot of people didn't see Netflix um, as a competitor. And now they're definitely kind of wondering, like, should we offer Netflix? Should we not? It seems like every device that came out in the past five years immediately just had Netflix as one of the services available on there. So I think that you can get almost Netflix on almost any device out there. And I think that is their their biggest uh, ace in the hole right now is the fact that they can offer that as a platform. Say, you know what, you can stream your show pretty much anywhere around the world um, through our service on any device. I think that's very valuable to a company. And we'll be seeing more uh, original content uh, from Netflix, House of Cards coming there as well. So uh, keep an eye on how that shakes out. Amazon also has original content as, as Hulu already, already does as well. Let's take a quick break. Thank our other sponsor for today's show, without which we could not do Tech News Today, Gazelle. Uh, in fact, without which I wouldn't have a little more cash in my pocket because I sold a bunch of stuff on Gazelle this summer. It is, I think, the simplest way for you to get rid of your old gadgets and turn them into cash. Uh, the nice thing about Gazelle is that it's easy to use. You go to the website, you punch in, uh, you just pick the picture of what it is you have. You, you fill out all the specs, what carrier it is, what, what, what the capacity is, and then you get a quote. You lock that quote in for 30 days uh, and you don't have the risk. If you decide not to sell it, 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 nothing happens. But if you do decide to sell it, you got 30 days to get it to them. They pay for the shipping. Uh, and then within a couple of days, you've got money either by check or by PayPal. And you can use that money for your new gadget. Or you could even buy your new gadget and then send the old one off to Gazelle. So go to gazelle.com, get an offer for your iPhone and do it today because gadgets probably not going to get more valuable. They're not quite in that collectible period yet. Uh, a little too new. Find out what your iPhone is worth. Take a minute. Go to gazelle.com, sell your used iPhone today. And we thank Gazelle for their support of Tech News Today. Guitar Heroes creator Charles Wang uh, getting profiled in Venture Beat. What, what's he up to? What, we haven't heard much from him in a while. Yeah, he's got a new startup, and it's called Green Th uh, Throttle Games. And uh, if you didn't know him before, he was the co-creator of Guitar Hero, and he used to work, work at Red Octane. So he likes the color and the, the, and, and the car metaphor. So Green Throttle Games is making a game controller that will work with Android smartphones and tablets when it debuts next year. And the idea is... They think that the future of consoles really is the phone. So the controller is going to connect to your smartphone or tablet. 
And then your your device connects to your television via a cable because they don't think Wi-Fi or wireless is fast enough for that kind of thing. And they provide the cable? Is that part of the package there? Or you have to just get I the cable? I think you have to get the yeah, cable. Right. Uh, the, the point is to make it easier to play the same games both in the living room and on the go. And he's in talks with video game developers to solve a problem. There's this, obviously, when you play a game on a phone, it's a very singular activity. What he wants to do is to create games that can be played by two people on a single big screen. There's an SDK available right now. And I mean, with 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 we've seen a ton ton of casual games come to phones. Is the future of console gaming the phone, or is the phone just a second screen? We've seen portable handhelds like uh, the PSP become a second screen for the PlayStation. We see project. We see a smart glass. Uh, what do you think, Tom? Do you think that phones are the are the future, or are they just a second part? Well, I think yeah, phone phone the 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 future of the phone could be very easily that you pop it in a dock wherever you are, and it's powerful enough. Uh, and I'm thinking five to ten years. It's powerful enough that it, it, it there's no reason to have a laptop. There's no reason to have a desktop. In most cases, uh, dedicated, you just dock that phone device. It's no longer a phone. It's just a portable processor with a screen built in and you can use it on its own you can dock it into anything else and this is another example of that situation we've we've seen this with the uh, the asus pad phone we've seen this with the uh, the lap dock sort of the early attempts at this modularization and, th and what he's saying is hey this phone can play some pretty high level first person shooter type games uh let's let's use it that way it doesn't it's not compelling if you think of angry birds right i've tried to play angry birds on the roku and frankly it's better than I expected, but it's not something I'm compelled to go back and do. That's that's a mobile game. On the other hand, if uh, if you're going to get uh, some of the like Infinity Blade that I can play with an actual controller and play on my big screen, then yeah, why not? If the as long as the phones get powerful enough to handle it, which I think they will. Rich, what do, you, what do you think? I mean, we have, we have a very enticing proposition for phone makers, right? They can become yeah. the next consoles, but the old guard's got to be freaking out because if they don't, if Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo. Are being they're up against every phone manufacturer what do they do well i think that's part of the problem too is that what they need to do is figure out how to make these games compelling enough to make them playable on a television make people want to actually play these things on their tv but then you have that fragmentation uh, as well so i mean is, is every single phone every single android phone iphone um, windows phone going to work with this thing and is every model going to work the same way so i think you have a lot of issues there um, it sounds interesting to me. It seems a little bulky. I mean, I get that in a couple of years your phone's going to be very powerful, but um, I'm not sure I want to play like that just yet. I mean, we we did a segment today actually including the Mogo, which uh, was mentioned in this article, which is, you know, this little controller that sort of connects to your Android phone. And I think that's pretty compelling because it's simple enough. You pop your phone into this little controller and you can actually play using sort of an analog controller versus, you know, touching just the screen. So I think there's definitely a place for this. I think if you go to a hotel room and you want to connect your phone to the uh, TV screen there or something like that and play or at home even, um, but it really is going to come down to the games and, I guess, giving developers a reason to come up with games that play well on the TV and that also take advantage of the hardware and the features here. This is a smart guy. I mean, obviously, he he kind of gets pop culture. He gets what people want to do, and he's looking to make things pretty simple. This might not replace an Xbox. This might not replace a PS3, but it might be a gaming system for a lot of people out there that's just simple and easy to use. Sarah, do you think this thing could catch on, like using your phone as a, as a console over cloud gaming at this point? Because if you have cloud gaming, you, can, you don't even need a device. You just need controllers and a television. Yeah, I mean, it's it, uh, it almost looks like how, you know, you would you would use your phone as a hotspot, you know, in order to do something else with another device that you could connect to your phone. I'm a, I'm never really a fan of like, ooh, I got to connect my phone to the TV over there, and then I've got to, I've I've got uh you know the, this um controller that is talking to my phone, but then I can use on the big screen just because. It seems like that could be something that your phone could be. Now, I know for a lot of people, it's like, well, now a phone isn't like a console. It doesn't feel like one. You don't have the controllers. You don't have the, you know, the the, the responsiveness and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I'm probably not the target market for this, but I can definitely see it being a solution for folks. Hey, if you've already got, already got your phone with you, you put those uh, controllers in a drawer somewhere, you take them out once in a while, or all the time, and and you don't need something like, you know, the Wii U, for example. 
Who wants to tie up their phone for that long, too? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm sitting on the couch, my phone is right there. Whether I'm watching TV, whether I'm doing anything else, it's just sitting right there next to me. Uh, if this mm -hmm. thing was 10 feet away in front of me and you're getting text messages and people are calling or you're trying to control your Sonos from your phone, I mean, let's, let's face it, our phones are becoming so many different things. I mean, how many things can we make this before it just doesn't work anymore. I mean, I need to have my phone available. So to have it to have it tied up to the screen like that for uh, an hour at a time or however long you're playing these games, I think that's an issue as well. I wonder how, how it handles calls and things. You're like, Richard console is ringing because like you're trying to play a game and there's going to be a notification coming up. That's got to be, that's a setting. That's, it must you know, be. Do, just, do, uh, do not interrupt. You know, we already got the do not disturb on iOS. Uh, there, and there's similar things in, a, in other uh, platforms as well. Well, it is time to take a little trip into rumor land again uh, regarding Microsoft Office coming to the iPhone and Android devices. Sarah, but the Verge uncovered something. Looks interesting. Yeah, so uh, sources, uh, unnamed of course, uh, do tell The Verge that the Office versions uh, for Android and iOS are coming next year. iOS will come first, they're saying, a couple months ahead of time. So February, March for iOS and, uh, and May uh, uh, for Android. So, okay, well, that's neither here nor there. So let's say that they're going to, uh, to arrive. What's the deal? Because we've talked a lot about, hey, Office coming to... Um, to, to two of the most popular mobile OSs around. How will it work? What will it mean? Is this smart on Microsoft's part? According to the Verge's sources, these will be free apps, so you can download them no problem. But like some other apps, uh, SkyDrive is a good example, OneNote, you have to have a Microsoft account just to basically play. You know, for viewing functionality, you have to have a Microsoft account. Now, that's all fine and good. That's not hard to do. But if you want edit functionality, that could be enabled with an Office 365 subscription. So that's where Microsoft says, this makes perfect sense. Let's just get everywhere. Because if somebody has a 365 subscription, then we're getting money per month uh, reoccurring, you know, because it's a a subscription model. So you buy an Office 365 subscription within the app. That's possible to do if, you know, you go, oh, I want to use this. I, I can see my PowerPoint doc, but I can't seem to get in there. Okay, I'll go ahead and, and, and uh, sign up for the service. And of course, if this is something you already have through a corporation or a small business, then you're already good to go. Um, organizations can distribute codes to enable uh, Office mobile editing for their users. So it's designed to be pretty simple. Now, Jason's got um, a page up that's showing the different Office 365 subscriptions that are available. So there's some tiers. There's a very simple tier, which is kind of like hosted email, that sort of thing. Now, I'm not positive, of course, that the iOS uh, Office 365 um, subscription models will exactly reflect what's already up on uh, Microsoft's website for the pricing. But the lowest tier pricing, which is $4 a month, says nothing about editing mobile docs on the go in the cloud. That one is only mentioned once you get to the $6 model and up. So potentially this would be something that would be somewhat unusable on iOS or Android unless you were paying at least a $6 a month subscription. Again, people who already have that subscription or are part of a small business where it totally makes sense. And there's other good stuff that you get. You, know, you get you know domain hosting and that sort of thing. That might make a lot of sense. But for just an iOS user who says, cool, now I have Microsoft Office, that's not really the case. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, it seems like if, you, if you're a business person or if you have a, I mean, I, I would even be hesitant to say startup because a lot of those people are using things that are in the cloud. Um, but sort of a business person that needs this functionality, this is definitely a great thing. I mean, you have the, pro, the company behind the program writing the program that lets you edit it on your phone. I think that's great. And this is long overdue. But for someone like me who is, totally moved into Google Docs. I mean, this is just so irrelevant. And I just rather have a, a nicer version of Google Docs to be able to edit things. But overall, this is a great move. And I think um, it's a good thing for people who need real editing of this kind of stuff on their phone, on the go, on their iPad. Um, and viewing, I mean, viewing is not a big deal. It'll, it'll be nice to view these things sort of in a native app. But it's kind of like Acrobat. It's like you don't really need that on your iPhone because you just open up the document and you can view it at least with the basic software included. Um, so I don't think like the view functionality, not necessarily the greatest thing, but I guess maybe with certain documents, they might render properly versus uh, some of the things I've seen on the phone, how they render in the native app.
I definitely use the uh, Google Drive app to view docs before it had the editing capability. Uh, and, and it was frustrating because I wanted to do editing, but there were times when I just needed to see what was in a doc and it was stored in the cloud. So I think that's smart. And I think Microsoft's smart to say, we're going to slowly disconnect purchasing software uh, from the 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 where we're going to make the real money, which is subscribing to our cloud service. Uh, there there are free versions of Microsoft Office floating around. You get one with uh, Windows RT, but what they really want you to do is sign up for one of these 365 accounts. And yeah, I use Google Docs for everything too, but I'm also frustrated by it. If Microsoft starts to provide a significantly better, uh, which a lot of people already think it is, experience that I can share with everyone in the cloud. It doesn't matter what device they're using, what platform they're using, uh, and it works better than Google Docs, even if I have to pay a little bit of money for it. I mean, I'd pay a little bit of money to get Google Docs improved as well. It might be worth switching to. And like you were saying, this gives you like device independence. Microsoft acting like a software company like it was before, just saying, okay, we're going to push out software for every single platform. You're going to use a Microsoft product on an Android device, iOS device, your Windows device, Mac. It doesn't matter because you're going to use our service anyway. I think I was most surprised that Microsoft's going to allow you to do purchases within the app because then Apple gets a cut out of that, mm. which I think is a little bit unusual because, I mean, Amazon obviously has, has had heated words with Apple when it comes to that. They don't allow you to buy Kindle books through their app anymore because they don't want to give a cut. If Microsoft is willing to even give a part to, to Apple while they're doing this, I'm a little surprised by that, but it also means that it makes it just easier to use. You don't want to find out that there's, uh, you have to go to a support page that gives you a link to how to purchase this thing. If you can just get the app for free, click buy. I think it's a smart move. Let's finish up with delicious, uh, not just delicious anything but the actual service to remember delicious the bookmarking site they're I still around that site i have a soft spot for buzz delicious. out loud and uh <laughs> why are we talking about it being dead it never really went away no it never did but i think a lot of people forgot about it <laughs> and uh especially after yahoo sold it off but they've been they've been working hard to improve it yeah there were a couple of redesigns a while ago but there's a brand new redesign that uh, delicious unveiled today it's a it's a demo site so not necessarily all the parts are working when you get to demo.delicious.com and when you look at the page it kind of looks a, a bit like a facebook or old dig with uh with this blue bar on top, there's a left-hand navigation with trending tags, middle feed of popular links with preview pane on the right. When you click a story, you'll see it on the right. You'll also see comments from the uh, the community uh, for certain stories. You might not see it for every one of them. Uh, it's very text-based, so forget about all these big tiles like Pinterest. That's all gone. They want nothing to do with that, it looks like. It, 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 it also looks like your profile page, uh, you'll, you'll see your links and you have that similar three-pane design it looks tremendously like Facebook because you'll have your picture on the top left. you got that blue bar on top and the text in the middle. It really does. It just screams Facebook to, to me. Uh, maybe. Maybe that this part of that inter will just show Our you colors design. colors match. Buy us. It just looked really strange. Uh, and the delicious blog, they explained that you know, inside is going to be faster. They have a new iOS app coming and everything. Uh, the demo is, is live now and the, the new version is rolling out at some point. I'm just kind of curious what people think about this because I have a soft spot for delicious. I used to use them all the time. I was I was happy when they left Yahoo because I thought Yahoo was going to kill them. Uh, do, do you, uh, Rich, do you think they got a fighting chance in this social networking world at this point, or is this this kind of this old remnant that just yeah. old guard? That's I'm I'm just trying to think of the use case. I mean I'm I'm always clicking links. I'm always trying to save stuff and looking for a better way to sort of organize my internet experience. And I haven't thought about these guys in a while. And I've gone you know I've seen the the iterations of the site and seen how they've tried to improve it over the years, but it never really served a great purpose. I mean, I feel like with so many different services that I'm already using nowadays, I might not need this anymore. Now, uh, the one service I think could be kind of neat, and I'm not sure if this is built in or if they're thinking of this, but I think a place to like aggregate all of my links, there's a service called, uh, I think it was like Trunkly, that would take like every link you ever shared, you know, whether it was on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, and it would kind of collect all of those into one place, which is kind of neat. It's kind of like a record of everything you've ever done. That shut down. I haven't really seen a similar product um, delicious could be something similar to that, but I don't know. I, I don't see the use for myself and I'm not sure. Uh, I think people are so ingrained in these other services at this point and especially like Instapaper. I mean, you have something like that where mm. that's where I'm saving stuff that I want to read later. Uh, links, I'm just bookmarking cause they're all synced across my cloud, you know, on, on Google Chrome and uh, Evernote for other stuff. So it's kind of tough to, to know whether I need this anymore. And Rich, just to, uh, expand on your Trunkly mention there. Actually, Delicious bought Trunkly uh, oh. back in 2011. So oh, there you go. go. Folded into so the maybe, Delicious that we see now. That. 
Yeah. So that might actually be a good thing for them because I, I do like that feature. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it's in this new iteration of it, but uh, that could be compelling to have a, because sometimes have you ever like shared a link or something and then like, you know, a year later you want to remember like, what was that link that I shared? Okay, let me, how, how would you find that? You know? So are you covering the social space a lot? I mean, is, is this is Delicious dead in the face of things like Pocket and Pinterest? Or is this, or is this like, like I guess Diggs relaunched too. I mean, are those old guard things just, do they have a chance? Well, Dig has relaunched to be a a lot more visual than it used to be and also a lot more simplified. I mean, Dig got very complicated and now all of that complication is gone. It's a new company and there's there's all of that. We mentioned how things look like Facebook and the color uh, combinations and everything. Let's remember that Delicious was blue before Facebook was. Uh, So this has been Delicious's color combination for a long time. It does look different. I think, I almost think that it's smart for a company like Delicious to say, listen, people uh, associate uh, associate us with the very, you know, web, you know, the early days of web 2.0, you know, and bookmarking, uh, saving is something that everyone knows that they need and they have a million different choices. And everybody's doing that very visual tile-based Pinterest-y type of a thing, including Dig. Well, we'll look at a, uh, look at a company like Reddit. Nobody's going to accuse Reddit of being visually stunning. Um, it is text all the time and, you know, in, in some people's opinions, sort of horrifically so. So if Delicious can, and especially with an acquisition like something like Trunkly, which is very compelling, you know, you, you're aggregating, saving links uh, and links that are shared from everywhere. You don't really have to think of Delicious as this place you need to keep going. Then that's smart. I also agree with Rich a bit that, it's been a really long time since I've felt the need to use Delicious. I have so many bookmark saving tools that built into my browsers now. Uh, variety, I mean, every single post has, you know, little uh, quick links for me to make sure that I you know, never uh, forget an article again, that this does seem like yet another option. But it is the old guard after all. I mean, Delicious has been around for a while and, and, um, and, I, and I wish them well. Uh, remember, there's Craigslist is is not pretty by a lot of standards either, mm-hmm. you know. So it doesn't have to be pretty to be useful; it just has to be useful. And I think that's the big question there. Let's finish up with the randomizer. Randomizer. So uh, Nintendo Wii U has another unboxing video out there. This is early, you know, it hasn't come out everywhere yet. Uh, but this is a special unboxing because it is Satoru Iwata of. Nintendo doing the unboxing, uh, and and the video has been posted up by Nintendo is making the rounds. It's I don't know. I as I thought it was pretty awesome. I, I watched this video actually twice because I was just I, I was getting a kick out of it. No, no, this, he puts on white gloves before he opens it up, and this is obviously not an, a pre-opened box. He's discussing how hard it is to open. He goes, "The box is a little stiff. It's rather heavy." Rather he heavy says at one point because they tell me it's four point five kilograms, and, and he, he just he just seems like he, it's almost like he's never seen one of these before. He said he had never opened the box before. And, it was. It looked legit. He looked like he was having trouble with some of the parts, and he goes, "I've made an awful mess." He had trouble with the dock for the for the gamepad, and I'm just like, uh, "Did you, do you want to have that as your image for this?" I mean, it's very real. It's humanizing, yeah. It, it, it's real, but do you did you want it to be like super easy? It's the Wii U. Even our CEO. How can many do that. how many people in the package design department got fired? He called it, he called that <laughs> power supply big. He's like, "This is the big power supply." And- people. People like real, though. I think that's uh, this was very brave of them to do this. And as any, as someone who has done unboxings, as you guys have as well, uh, they're not easy. And they're very challenging to do right uh, on the fly like that. So the fact that he was just saying stuff, that this was all stream live, the fact that he was saying stuff live and kind of just giving his reaction immediately, I think people do respect that. Um, and it is kind of fun to see that happening from someone within the company. I love the white gloves. That's a, that's a yeah. nice uh, Japanese touch that you just don't get from... Uh, is it okay American to wear unboxers. those after Labor Day, though? I guess it doesn't matter in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Let's, uh, let's move on and see what's on the calendar, Sarah. Okay. Ad Tech is happening today and tomorrow in New York. Big uh, ad-related conference there. Groupon is announcing their earnings tomorrow, or its earnings, rather, because corporations aren't people. Um, Unless you're I'm just a donor. Gonna, <laughs> I'm just going to go out on a limb and say it might not be good news. 
because Groupon's had yeah. kind of a hard time of it. Uh, but here's good news. Angry Birds Star Wars is out tomorrow, as is the Samsung Galaxy S3 Mini in the UK anyway. It's arriving there tomorrow. Also, in the in the wake of uh, a lot of uh, voting chaos in New Jersey, because of course we've got people without power and, and not being able to you know receive mail and that sort of thing, officials have extended ballot submissions for the election that has already been called to this Friday. And finally, something else that was already uh, also affected uh, by the storm, the Facebook gifts event. We didn't really know what they were going to talk about specifically because they've already rolled out the service. It was postponed because the storm happened at about the same time. Is on again. This time it's been rescheduled for November 15th. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Got a voicemail, and our voice mailer would like to uh, talk to us a little bit about the economics behind malware. We were talking about this the other day. D&D crew, it's Scott from PC Perspective calling. I just caught your discussion on the economics of malware. While ransomware is scary, it does raise an interesting point. It is getting harder to be an attacker. These people innovate because they need to, not because they want to. Windows is getting too secure, so they try to do Flash. That was getting harder, so they tried Java ransomware and fake any malware. Survival of the fittest implies death of the weakest. Enjoy the show. Yeah, so uh, that's a good point. It, it could be that the uh, prices are going down and the, and, and becoming more competitive because they, they have to, uh, but the access is so easy. You'd think that the being uh, being more difficult to make malware would, would actually drive the price up because they have to spend so much effort. Well, that means that the ones that remain just get cheaper and cheaper. Yeah, I guess. We got an email from Andrew M. He says, hey, why not have ARM and Intel in the same machine? Just like you can have discrete graphics or dedicated graphics card on the same machine. Many years ago, I've seen Z80 chips and an Apple II are similar, so why not do that? Um, I'm not sure what the advantage would be there, uh, but there could be one. I'm just... It doesn't spring to mind immediately. We'll run iOS uh, concurrently with uh, OS X. Or oh, like they used to run Windows 3.1 on System 9... Uh, with a risk chip I that, so. that had dual processors. I, I think it's in Apple's best interest to fuse OS X and iOS more than to keep them separate and have the ability to toggle between both on a machine. It's just my take. That might have been System 8 or 7. I don't remember, but yeah. If I take the X and then the I from iOS, that'd be 11. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thanks for submitting stories at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, uh, letting us know what stuff you'd like to see on the show. We really appreciate folks who do that. And Rich DeMiro, thank you uh, for taking the time and joining us from KTLA. Let folks know where they can find your work, where they can follow you, and what you're up to these days. Uh, yeah, I'm on KTLA and a bunch of TV stations nationwide, probably on morning shows where you live. Uh, richontech.tv is the website where you can follow me on Twitter and Facebook and all that good stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's me. Excellent, Thanks. man. Thanks for having me on. It's always fun. Good to see you. Uh, you can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us TNT at twit.tv or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Dan Benjamin from the 5x5 Network joins us tomorrow morning. We'll see you then.